My name is Julia Grabs. I'm the editor in chief for Jack Case Reports. And this is the webinar on the mini focus issues on co intervention complications. It's a great pleasure today to uh, host four distinguished interventionalists from uh, United States and United Kingdom. And I will start with uh, Dr. Eric Bates, who is professor of cardiology and internal medicine at the University of Michigan. Dr. Joel Giblet, who is a consultant cardiologist, interventionalist cardiologist at Royal Papworth Hostel in Cambridge in United Kingdom. Dr. Mladen Vidovic, who is professor of medicine at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and Dr. David Fishman, who is professor of medicine at the Sydney Kimmel Medical College of Thomas Jefferson University. So thank you so much for being here today. I will go ahead and start directly with the first case that has the title Giant Iatrogenic Pseudoaneurysm of Right Pulmonary Artery Compressing the Left, the left Atrium. The first author is Dr. Rimal Sergani, the last author, Dr. Mansour al jufan And this is a case combined uh, from two hospitals, King Saud University in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia, and also few authors are from Madonna del Soroso Hospital in Italy. So first of all, they describe a 40-year-old female with a trilogy of allo and left pulmonary artery hypoplasia treated with VSD closure, pulmonary valvotomy, and LPA stenting. As it's normal, uh, during the time she's found to have residual severe PR, stenosis of the proximal RPA, RV dilatation with mildly depressed uh, function, and reduced exercise tolerance, and angiography confirms exactly the same results. Then the authors decide to go ahead and do a percutaneous PV pulmonary valve implantation with an Edward Sapien valve size 26 millimeters and do perform an RPA dilatation. During the RPA dilatation, they, they, they see that there is an intimal tear of the RPA with extravasation into the mediastinum. So they decide to percutaneously inject the transcatheter Kefsol, a highly hemostatic polymer agent, and the patient then was transferred to ICU. Three days later, the patient, though, describes chest pain, and she undergoes a transthoracic echocardiogram. You can see the pulsatile cavity in the roof of the left atrium, and it's a mobile oval-shaped mass sized of 2.5, 1.8 centimeters, and there is also an RPA intimal flap, and also here an inferior pseudoaneurysm. So it's quite huge pseudoaneurysm at the inferior side. Then they perform a CT scan with contrast that confirms that there is a tear within the inferior portion of the proximal RPA with pseudoaneurysm between the RPA ascending aorta and the left atrium. It's of huge size and confirms the echo findings. The Edward Sapiens valve is well seated, uh, well functioned, but the and also the angiography confirms the presence of the pseudoaneurysm. The authors uh, thought about it very well. They uh, after a multidisciplinary meeting, they decided to start with endovascular approach and stand implantation. And here is how they perform the stand implantation to the intimal tear of uh, the RPA. The result was quite successful, and they managed to, uh, to absorb the RPA tear. And uh, they described that surgery was a possible option if, of course, the endovascular approach was failing. So, however, to our knowledge, and of course to the literature, this has never been reported that they did endovascular standing when they had the pseudoaneurysm. Do you have any uh, comments on this case? Well, I think it's a um, it's, it, it, it's it's a case that has some uh, very nice um, visual. It's an amazing picture to see of the um, pseudoaneurysm. I wonder whether at the time that there was the intimal tear. Um, they they used a sort of polymeric agent, which um, uh, the, there's relatively little literature around uh, doing that for for treatment of intimal tear. And it was an interesting approach. Uh, when I uh, uh, reviewed this case, I could only find that it was actually being uh, placed into pseudoaneurysms before. So I wonder, I guess, in terms of what could we have done to avoid this complication? I wonder whether the, the endovascular repair at the time was uh, something worth considering rather than relying on a sort of polymeric glue to either sort of glue down the intimal surface or perhaps embolize the um, uh, the area that uh, was undertaken. 
So you would do that uh, at the time zero and not three days later when it's described towards the chest. I, I think it's very easy in hindsight to look back and say that you might do that rather than allowing the pseudoaneurysm to develop. I don't know what others think. Yeah, the current concern, of course, is a rupture in pulmonary hemorrhage. And the one of the one of the complications of the balloon artery of the pulmonary artery catheter is when you blow the balloon up, you rupture the pulmonary artery is a slightly different type of situation, but covered stent now saves that, whereas uh, there have been deaths reported from pulmonary artery rupture due to catheter interventions, even just diagnostic. And you, and you bring a good point, Eric, is that uh, it's always a, a tough decision about the covered stents for pseudoaneurysm, because as we know, in, in coronaries, this is something definitely you don't, you don't want to be doing. It. So it's a uh, it's more of a, uh, a rescue type of our operation of putting covered stents than uh, than your uh, plan A. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I will move to the next case uh, that has the title cardiac tamponade secondary to IVC filter retrieval. The first author is Dr. Emily Margolin and the last author, Dr. Gina Sean from Keck School of Medicine of UC USC in Los Angeles, California. So just a brief presentation uh, from my side, 74-year-old female, she presented for scheduled IVC filter retrieval, and they performed uh, central venous access via the right internal jugular vein. And while they advanced um, the sheath to the IVC, uh, they tried to uh, snare the, the filter, and uh, that was unsuccessful. And then they advanced forceps through the sheath and tried to grasp the superior portion of the filter and after it retracting the filter into the sheath they saw the filter screw hook was protruding from the mid portion of the sheath on fluoroscopy as we can see here fluoroscopy was very uh, important in uh, understanding that the filter hook was protruding however despite these findings uh, the sheath and the filter were removed and then the authors visual, visually inspected the seed and, and that demonstrate a linear tear, tear from the distal to mid portion with the filter hook protruding from the seed. And post removal, they demonstrate no evidence of cost, contrast extravasation, filling defects or stasis. But however, 10 minutes later, of course, the patient went acutely hypotensive, tachycardic, and she had signs of tamponade. And she was started on nor norepinephrine, and she had tamponade physiology, and of course she had the um, emergency pericardiocentesis. They removed 265 ml of uh, blood, pericardial fluid, and they inserted the pericardial drain. That was removed 24 hours later, and the patient was discharged home two days later. So here they tried to retrieve the IVC filter. And the com main complication was uh, tamponade. Do you think that, um, so they saw the filters hook, how how important was to to avoid that? Sorry, I'm... I'd say is, uh, I, I learned this from a, uh, from a senior person is, uh, uh, who told me, you know, if you push harder, uh, you will win. Uh, and you will overpower any biological system, and that's actually served me pretty well over the years. I mean, uh, if you if you push or pull or any wires or uh, or implements in the body, you will you you will essentially get get what you want, but you will tear up stuff uh, along the way. So I think just just shows that uh, sometimes you need some tactile feedback and uh, to be be careful how much force you apply uh, before you pull things out. So the, yeah, the IVC filters are kind of controversial. They've never been shown to decrease mortality. They do acutely decrease the risk of pulmonary embolism, supposedly. And the more recent practice has been to take them out before they clot off or uh, penetrate through the IVC or embolism. And uh, one lesson I think is important here, besides what you just heard, is to look at the fluoroscopy very carefully. And the rush of trying to get people through the lab, uh, you still have to be exquisitely careful looking to see what you have. So you can see a very nice image of the hook outside the sheath. So you have to worry about it tearing something. And in this instance, I guess it did. 
I don't know if they could have rotated it and avoided the complication, but they immediately recognized it and the pericardiosynthesis was significant, was, was successful. So it's a nice rescue and a very curious complication from an IBC filter retrieval. I think these cases uh, um, highlight the importance of uh, uh, knowing where your um, rescue equipment is as we push and pull with a lot of these structural cases, uh, different things. So. Uh, I, I think it's important to know where our equipment is if you need to uh, uh, use a covered stent to um, fix a, a, a tear in an IVC, pericardial synthesis, particularly now in the COVID era, when you have just a dedicated room for COVID patients, you know, you may not have uh, uh, um, that equipment available. So I think it's important in any of these uh, cases we're going to discuss is to know where the emergency equipment is. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, all of you. Uh, the third case now has the title late type A dissection after transfemoral aortic valve replacement. And the first author is Dr. Michael Pontius, and the last author, Dr. Uh, Castigliano uh, Bamitipati. And the authors are from Oregon Health and Science University in Portland. So just a brief presentation again from my side. So an 87-year-old female, she presented to the emergency department with acute onset of uh, back pain, and she reported no prior symptoms, and uh, they detected a mild systolic ejection murmur two to four, uh, two, two, two out of six, sorry, at the left upper sternal border, and she had some tenderness to palpation. She also had rheumatoid arthritis in upper and lower extremities, uh, and she had missing toes bilaterally. And from, she had a lot, a, a huge, long, very long past medical history with chronic Stanford type B dissection, atrial fibrillation and apixaban, osteoporosis, lumbar spinal stenosis, hypothyroidism, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and rheumatoid arthritis on prednisone, methotrexate, and a tansy prep. So her frailty score was two, albumin was four prior to operation. She underwent a TAVI with 26 millimeter valve and she had moderate severe uh, perivalvular aortic insufficiency. Then, uh, though she, she had a gated CT because the patient immediately after she complained of, of, the, of the chest pain after the TAVI and, uh, the, and the back pain radiating to the back, and she had this acute Stanford type A aortic dissection with an intramural hematoma originating from the supra annular frame of the core valve, extending along the anterolateral ascending aorta, and through the arch and to the perivisceral peri aorta and down to the root. So the ascending aorta was 50 millimeters, and it was before 42 millimeters. This is something very important to discuss about the, the diameter of the ascending aorta. And also they saw, of course, pericardial effusion and the Stanford type B dissection. So the patient then was taken into the operating room and they demonstrate here the ascending aortic replace. They did the ascending aortic replacement. They, you can see the huge aneurysm and the dissect, they, they, replay, they fixed the dissection and uh, there was, uh, they fixed also the perivalvular leak repair and they did a frozen elephant trunk. So a long operation, 87 years old, he survived the operation and the authors here describe nicely with this uh, diagram how uh, the aortic insufficiency uh, between the left and the non-coronary sinus was repaired uh, from below the paravalvular skirt of the uh, core valve and the native aortic annulus. This is quite interesting uh, surgically. So then uh, here, just to stimulate a little bit the discussion, uh, the arguments from the authors were that the treatment with steroids and immunologic therapy for rheumatoid disease weakened the aortic wall, and from 42 it expanded to 50, and then it dissected. Also, they discuss about enabling the dissection by the metallic frame around the transcatheter valve that may have stimulated the dissection, and also that the patient 
had a forced hypertension and maybe the malpositioning of the tower valve may have contributed to the dissection. What do you think here? I mean, what I, what I like about this case is that uh, it's, it's really interesting because you have this frail elderly female with uh, these factors, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, kyphoscoliosis, uh, treatment with steroids, uh, immunologics, and of course, she's not a great surgical candidate. So, uh, so what would you do? We think you would go go ahead and uh, place a tabber. But then, what happens is, uh, uh, and as you mentioned, Julia, she did have a previous stain for B dissection. Well, all of these things really weaken your media of the aorta, right? You know, you have a uh, elderly female, uh, uh, which uh, aorta is completely being damaged by steroids, and then you get the dissection uh, type A, which they nicely recognize. So you, you're in a, in a certain way, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. You know, they clearly first time would have not been a good idea to do surgery, but second time they had no choice. And then the second thing that's striking is that the surgeons preserve the taver, repaired the paravalvular leak, and then did the root replacement. I think that is a tour de force. I think it's a, it's a great save. But again, it shows you rheumatoid arthritis and steroids are not good for your uh, blood vessels any way you take it. Thank you, Mlade. Any further Be nice, be any? nice to your cardiac surgeons. It's as we carve more and more procedures away from our surgical specialists. When there's a complication, there's nothing better than superb surgery. And the, the job these surgeons did was outstanding, saving this lady's life. I, I think I would agree, and I think you, the, the the more we uh, the the TAVR is done in in frail patients with lots of comorbidities, the more you've got to expect that the, these complications are going to come along and be seen more and more frequently. And I don't know what the rest of the the panel thinks, but I I think it's really tough to blame uh, blame the valve to this. I think this is just a, a very complicated milieu that uh, contributed to all of this. I think uh, the ladies were quite lucky to be alive and and the authors did a great job because um, it was a complicated case and maybe this complication was, uh, let's say, unavoidable, you know, with all this. Perfect. Uh, and the last case uh, of uh, this uh, part A of the webinar has the title Common Calcified Femoral Artery Rapture after intravascular lithotripsy for tower implantation. And the first author is Dr. Carmen Spacaroterla. So apologies for the uh, pronunciation. <laughs> and the last author, Professor Ciro Indolfi and uh, from Magna Grecia University Cardiology in Catanzaro in Italy. So just to, again, a brief presentation, an 82-year-old man, he was admitted with acute heart failure symptoms he was discovered to have a severe aortic stenosis. And as you can see, again, these patients, as we discussed just previously, they have a, a, a long past medical history usually. So he had um, a right hip arthroplasty before, severe uh, COPD, hypertension, former smoker, carotid artery disease, type 2 diabetes, and permanent AF. And he had the CT for TAVR axis, which is not very encouraging but the authors felt that the left axis was better to go through for the TAVR. And what they did, they selected the left common femoral artery after an MDT meeting. And during this step, they, they checked the correct position of the wire into the superficial femoral artery. They did not notice at the time any vascular dissection or wall rupture. The valve failed to cross the common femoral artery uh, with and without the seat, and then the authors decide to use uh, intravascular lithotripsy, uh, which is we have seen a lot of papers um, here as we discuss uh, with you as editors. We have seen a lot of papers with IVL, and they did four cycles uh, with shockwave balloon, and they successfully implanted the 34 34 millimeter valve. Uh, however, after they decide then to get an angiogram after the failure of the two proglides and that demonstrate no dissection starting from the distal segment of the external iliac artery extending to the axis side. And uh, David, I was wondering if you can help me with the next, uh, here is the dissection of the distal iliac artery. 
far away from the puncture side. And you can see there just a, what appears to be a linear dissection up in the uh, iliofemoral area. And this was their main complication. And uh, what they did is actually they put a stand in at the left common uh, femoral artery. And after multiple dilatations, they managed actually to have an acceptable result. David, uh, what do you think about this case? So, you know, lithotripsy is being more commonly used for treating peripheral vascular disease, and in particular, preparing the vessel uh, uh, prior to uh, TAVR uh, insertions uh, to help accommodate the devices in the sheets. Um, I think this, this case highlights some important points. The most important is preparation. You know, one could argue that this vessel probably with or without lithotripsy may not have been big enough to accommodate uh, um, the, the, the sheath and the device they were using. Um, so I, I think it's important to, you know, really be uh, prepared uh, to understand the vasculature. So, you know, putting a, a TAVR device in is, is one thing, but getting to the, uh, to the uh, aortic uh, valve is another thing. And I think um, there ne needs to be a good skill set in, uh, in, in treating vascular disease. So I think prepping, being aware you're dealing with it, recognizing the problem as early as possible, and then obviously uh, being able to treat this as they did in this case by putting a covered stent in. Um, so, you know, as we talk about structural disease and structuralists, you know, they really have to have a good understanding of not just the, 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 the valve structures and stuff, but the vasculature. In this case, they prepared themselves beforehand, which we should be doing, should they have a, a, what could be a very disastrous result with a, a perforation. Interestingly, we have not seen a lot of uh, perforations with lithotripsy, uh, um, but there are some cases as demonstrated here. It's it's a definitely uh, emerging emerging technology to deal with uh, 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 TAVR access site, and it's uh, I, I think we still still quite to learn. But again, as you said, uh, Julia, in Jack case reports, we really reviewed uh, a whole spectrum of lithotripsy cases, and uh, it's it's clearly going to be an interesting uh, interesting time to see what this can or cannot do for us. And I think they, um, they they did the right thing here. They had a, they had a safety wire from the um, from the right femoral artery. This isn't the case to have a single access site in the groin with your other access site from the from the radial artery. This is a case where you need to prepare properly if you're going to be treating like this. So I'll ask my colleagues. You know, all the push to do radial access for coronaries. Uh, um, are we losing skills in the in the femoral and should just you know people doing structural work really concentrate on vascular structural work and stay away from the uh, the coronary realm because you know I, I think you have to have a lot of skills when you're dealing with the vasculature uh, um, in this like in this case it's, so it's I, a nice, nice provocative question but we have our british colleague and we know that uh, bcis database showed that femoralists are better uh, the radialists are <laughs> femoralists uh and uh it's very nicely shown that uh, these skills are nicely transferable back and forth, and I think it's. Uh, it's uh, I think it's about being, it's about being a careful operator. It's about knowing where your limits are, what what you can do safely and what you can't. Not taking unnecessary risks. Um, I, I think all of those things. I think if you know if you need to if you're not happy with your your femoral axis and your large bore axis, then you need to be uh, stepping away from doing these sort of procedures. But femoral has evolved, you know, femoral nowadays is not femoral five years ago or femoral 10 years ago. I think it's, uh, it's, cl it's clear that we learned so much more from radial and with uh, ultrasound guided access and, and micropuncture. I think we are so much, so much better femoralist than we used to be. My fellows are teaching me how to use the ultrasound to get femoral access. Thirty yeah, years later, nice. I, I did. I did a venous access the other day, and the fellow says, so, "Doctor Vidovich, you're not going to use ultrasound." And he was serious about that. That it, it was a pretty, pretty straightforward uh, right heart cath with five French, and I almost felt bad. But I said, "No, I think I can do it without it." But again, times have changed. It's perfect. Thank you so much, all of you. Um, at this point, uh, I will just remind the audience to subscribe to Jack Specialty Journalist Podcast. And this was the end of uh, the first part of uh, complications in interventional cardiology and procedures. Thank you very much for your attention.